Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today we are once again going to talk about YouTube and their copyright infringement system. In particular, how they use automated systems, robots, algorithms, whatever you want to call them, to identify copyright infringing material on their service for the benefit of, ostensibly, those copyright holders, right? And we've talked about this issue a lot in virtual legality. We've talked a lot about what copyright infringement means, what fair use means. We covered it in respect of various reaction channels and how they were getting cease and desist letters from companies that purported to own the intellectual property that they were referencing, et cetera, et cetera. But today we've got a story that is actually kind of breaking the mold a little bit because this is actually one that focuses on a law school. And in particular, a law school that was focused on describing what copyright infringement is versus what fair use is and talking about all these issues that put a video up on YouTube and then immediately got demonetized and found themselves going through the Byzantine system that I know a number of you viewers have already gone through yourselves in trying to deal with what a copyright strike is, what demonetization is, what it means to decide whether or not to challenge, to counter notify on a demonetization decision, especially when the ostensible intellectual property holder says, nope, that complaint that your robot spotted is good, so we are not going to back down from this specific issue, and how even a law school looks at it and says, this is untenable, this is inequitable, and even though we can kind of pull some strings behind the scenes, this isn't fair for how to operate for regular YouTube users. And I know a number of you know that already, but I think it's always interesting to kind of dive in and look at how someone that is a specialist looks at these issues when they haven't kind of grappled with them before and finds exactly what we have found in virtual legality and what many of you have found just operating your own channels in issues with how this whole thing functions. So I've pulled up a Verge article. It says, go read about a law school's ridiculous battle over YouTube copyright strikes. Copyright law is two things a gnostically complex rubric for deciding who can reproduce a work of art and one of the most powerful legal forces on the internet. But precisely how complex and how powerful? Well, enough that a major law school thought it might lose its YouTube channel in a copyright dispute over a video explaining copyright law. Now, I will link this video or this article in the description to my video so you can check it out entirely. But they say right in the headline, go read about this. So we they actually put up a blog post. The NYU School of Law, or more specifically, the Engelberg Center on Innovation Law and Policy, put up a delightfully kind of robust blog post describing this whole thing. And as you know, if you follow the channel, if you listen to this series, we like to go to the source. And this is very interesting. It says, how explaining copyright broke the YouTube copyright system. This is a story about how the most sophisticated copyright filter in the world, YouTube's, prevented us from explaining copyright law. It doesn't involve TikTok dance moves or nuanced 90s remixes featuring AOC or what you might be more familiar with in virtual legality reaction channel videos or Fortnite dance moves. No, it involves a debate at a law school conference over how and when one song can infringe the copyright of another and how exactly one proves in a courtroom if the accused song is substantially similar enough to be deemed illegal. In truth, This is exactly what fair use is designed to protect, right? We've looked at this in the past, but fair use is codified in the Copyright Act directly to allow people to make critiques and to use another's intellectual property specifically for that purpose. And we've discussed this ad nauseum in virtual legality. But when you describe something as a debate at a law school about what is substantially similar enough in a musical composition to qualify as infringement for another song, In order to have that discussion at a fundamental level, you have to be able to play the songs. You have to be able to show the melodies to show what might be infringing and what might not be. This is educational use at its foundational principles, right? And this is a law school that specializes in talking about copyright. Continuing with their post, it says, in the end, because it was blocked by one of the music companies who owns the song, it also became a textbook study in how fair use still suffers online and what it takes to push back when a video is flagged. A copyright riddle wrapped up in an algorithmic enigma, symbolic of the many current content moderation dilemmas 
faced by online platforms today. You can watch the video live here. I will, of course, link this blog post in the description. You can follow all these links to your heart's content. You can listen to it in its podcast form over on this other link. Uh, And if you're curious about European law, they've also got another video that they're going to show, I believe, at the end of April. But here's the story in this particular instance. It says, the video in question was a recording of the Proving Similarity panel, which was part of the Engelberg Center's Proving IP Symposium in May of 2019. The panel, which was moderated by Professor Joseph Fishman, featured presentations and discussions by Judith Finnell and Sandy Wilbur. Ms. Finnell and Ms. Wilbur were the musicologist uh, or musicologist experts for the opposing parties in the high-profile Blurred Lines copyright infringement case. In that case, the estate of Marvin Gaye accused Robin Thicke and Farrell R- Williams of infringing on Gaye's songs Gotta Give It Up when they wrote the hit song Blurred Lines. The primary purpose of the panel was to have two musical experts explain to the largely legal audience how they analyze and explain songs in copyright litigation. This is a very important concept, not just for those of you who are following virtual legality, listening to this video and kind of thinking about these issues for your own videos, but also just in general to know when you're producing a piece of music, how close you can get to another piece of music. And we hear this all the time on the radio or in just symphonic compositions in movies. There are little bits and pieces that are evocative of other things that you might hear or you might recall. And those aren't necessarily infringing just because a couple of notes are shared. But if the heart of a copyrighted work is used for a purpose that wasn't licensed, that can be infringement. And these kinds of experts are enormously helpful for explaining those kinds of things. And so to essentially say, okay, well, if you reference the song that you want to use as an explanation, that's copyright infringement. That's obviously going to be a problem for everybody that wants to learn these kinds of things. And that's what this article, this blog post is really all about. It says the panel opened with each expert giving a presentation about how they approach song analysis. These presentations included short clips of songs, both in their popular recorded version and then versions stripped down to focus on specific musical elements, as you might do in a court case to establish this similarity that if you're representing one of your clients you want to claim or you want to defend against, you strip it down to show that similarity. The takedown. In June of 2019, a video of the panel was posted to the NYU School of Law YouTube page. In August of 2019, a new version of the video was posted. The audio track of the new video was identical to the first. However, more legible versions of the presentation slides were inserted in order to make it easier for viewers to read them. You see that a lot, right? When you're looking at educational materials, if somebody's using a PowerPoint presentation or something along those lines, you can have an edited version of the video made that goes up a little bit later that takes those slides and makes them direct source images so that it makes more sense for a video observer rather than someone in the room at the time. But unlike that first video, this second video was flagged by YouTube's content ID system for multiple claims of infringement. And you see them right here. If you are a YouTube channel operator, you've seen this kind of screen before. I've talked in the past about how my Video Games of the Year series generally has these kind of little uh, yellow markers placed on them for use of trailer imagery and trailer music that some of the publishers don't like so much. It's probably fair use. I don't care to fight it because I don't care so much about monetization. But again, this is a law school. And this law school looks at this and says, wait, what? Why would this be flagged? And if you're familiar with how YouTube operates, they don't have a person sifting through all these things. They collect these samples of all these things that various owners claim as copyrighted materials. And then they have robots that scrub through all the videos. And so in the first instance, they go and they find all of this stuff as matching up, which it would because these lawyers, these professors, these teachers are trying to explain what copyright infringement is. And by trying to explain it, YouTube says, hey, that's a song we know, and this song is owned by someone else, and so you can't monetize this video. And monetization, probably not at the major kind of intersection of what NYU cares about on this particular point, but as we've talked about in virtual legality, you know, one thing that happens with YouTube is that monetized videos are more likely to get picked up by the YouTube computer, sent out to more people. And if you are in the business of educating folks, you want that to be as seen by as many people as possible, so you don't want these flags. But even more kind of philosophically to the point here, 
If you're NYU Law, you specialize in understanding copyright law and fair use applications to copyright law, you don't love this on a philosophical basis, right? You say, hey, we didn't infringe. This is very, very clear fair use. And so why are we getting all these buttons? Why will our video not be spread? Hey, maybe we do care. Why is this not going to be monetized? You don't have a good answer for us. And now the blog post goes into what I think a number of you have already faced, which are these very difficult questions that the current kind of DMCA framework that YouTube adopts into its notice, counter notice, copyright strike, formal system, all those difficult decisions that it places upon what are very often small, mid-sized YouTubers that don't necessarily have the ability to go and pay tens of thousands of dollars for a lawyer to fight the universal music groups of the world. Continuing with the post, the video used clips of the songs in question to illustrate specific points about how they were analyzed in the context of copyright infringement litigation. As such, we were confident that our use of the songs were covered by fair use and then disputed the claims using YouTube's internal system. They hit the button that said, nah, this is crap. We are disputing this claim. Shortly thereafter, we received notice that the rights holder was rejecting our dispute on multiple songs. Hi, NYU School of Law. After after reviewing your dispute, UMG, the Universal Music Group, has decided that their copyright claim is valid. Why this can happen? The copyright owner might disagree with your dispute, or the reason you gave for disputing the claim may have been insufficient or invalid. NYU looks at this and says, uh, okay. So they just say, nah, our infringement claim is still good. So they continue. They say the decision and the question, still confident that our uses were covered by fair use, as well they should be, We researched the YouTube counter notification process. Now we're going to look at that a little bit more in depthly. We've talked about this in virtual legality before, but we can go over this again. Copyright counter notification basics or, or, hey, so you've had a strike put against you or you've been demonetized. Copyright protected content may be taken down from YouTube if it's been uploaded without the copyright owner's authorization. A counter notification is a legal request for YouTube to reinstate a video that was removed for alleged copyright infringement. When is a counter notification appropriate? You can only pursue a counter notice when a video that you uploaded was disabled due to a mistake or misidentification of the content. This includes fair use. Very important, right? We've talked about this in virtual legality before, but not only does it include fair use, the DMCA is expressly read by the courts to require the complaining IP owner to consider whether fair use should apply when they make their notification under the DMCA. Now, one of the issues that happens here is that the IP owner is not making that initial claim. It's the YouTube robot that is doing that. So the YouTube robot goes and does that. And then the IP owner essentially confirms it, says, yep, that's all good. And that creates its own issues with the way the law works. And we're going to look at the DMCA towards the end of this video. But just understand that when we're talking about statutes, they don't always reflect the reality on the ground for how things actually operate. And YouTube has done some good things here. Their algorithm is very sophisticated, maybe too sophisticated in certain parts. But they've done some good things here by essentially allowing light infringement and just merely moving monetization over, making sure people are paid if they own the intellectual property, while keeping content creators able to still make these videos and not really worry about getting sued and all these things. YouTube has helped smooth out some of the uh, bumps in the road for what is the, the digital era. But by doing that, they've also created their own issues. And most specifically, as we've talked about in virtual legality in the past, They have incentivized IP owners to abuse this system, to simply claim things that aren't true, to not consider fair use terribly uh, in detail. And YouTube is just the middleman in all this. So YouTube doesn't have a great deal of incentive to really help make sure that fair use is considered. It's really at the end of the day between the NYUs of the world and the Universal Music Groups of the world. And while Universal Music Group very probably should never have affirmed this particular claim against this video, their doing so is not terribly penalized right now under the law. We've talked about reforms that I think are necessary for the DMCA. One of them would be if you are going to make this claim and it is you know, patently false, uh, especially if you go through a full court system, 
It needs to be more clear that you owe liquidated damages of some kind. You owe penalties of some kind. This needs to be more penalizable at the intellectual property content holder uh, side of things because otherwise they don't see those penalties. They've got a cadre of lawyers to really fight off things and they make these claims when fair use would very clearly seem to apply in this instance and in many, many others. But you'll also notice here as we read the counter notification basics that this doesn't actually apply to at least what NYU described in their blog post, which is that their video wasn't taken down. What we see there are yellow lights. We see demonetization. We see uh, the advertising revenue going to the song owners rather than NYU. And so before the video has been taken down, this whole process doesn't apply fully because this process was designed to meet YouTube's obligations more precisely detailed as safe harbors within the DMCA process. So it says this only applies when a video has been disabled. It includes fair use. It should not be pursued under any other circumstances. If your video was disabled for copyright but does not fit the criteria above, you should not pursue a counter notice. Instead, just wait for your strike to expire, usually after 90 days. You may also want to reach out to the copyright owner to get a retraction of the copyright infringement. Then it says, hey, you hit these buttons, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what the NYU Law School was looking at. They were trying to comply with to figure out what they do next from this step. And it's worth noting here that this is the kind of message you get from YouTube, right? We've talked in my videos and on my Twitter and social media in the past about one of the more annoying things with YouTube is that they are very, very circumspect about delivering any specific piece of information about the decisions that they make. So a lot of virtual legality videos are hit with a not suitable for advertisers demonetization at the start of the video. And I always challenge it because, heck, this is a law channel. We talk about legal issues. Yes, we do it through a pop culture lens. Sometimes those dovetail with controversial issues in the news, et cetera, et cetera. And almost always I win those. YouTube says, oh yeah, we were wrong. Usually after most of the people have watched the video, but you know, say la vie, what are you going to do? Sometimes though, especially in the recent past, the last couple months, they've come back and said, no, we looked at this and it's still unsuitable for advertisers. Thank you for asking. And you don't ever hear any reason why. You don't have it applied to a specific subsection of their advertising guidelines or their community guidelines or a specific word they might have found that they didn't like you saying, those kinds of things. You don't get that precision. And so here you get the same kind of lack of precision. Uh, they disagreed. Uh, we don't have any more information why this can happen. Uh, you were wrong uh, or they disagreed with you. Sorry about that. We then discovered, speaking in the blog post here is NYU Law, that if we continued to challenge the accusation of infringement and lost, our video would be subject to copyright strikes. Copyright strikes, of course, being the biggest, largest YouTube bugaboo. If you are trying to run a YouTube channel, copyright strikes are an extra legal kind of method that YouTube has devised for themselves that essentially is designed to say, repeat offenders, we don't want your business. Unfortunately, what it is used as is a cudgel because... So many YouTubers that might well be in the right that could win a court case if they had $100,000 and four years to pursue it, that they could win that case can't risk something as big as a copyright strike. Because let's talk about what copyright strikes do, right? It says, if you get a copyright strike, that means your video has been taken down from YouTube because a copyright owner sent us a complete and valid legal request asking us to do so. Now, they're referring specifically to what the DMCA requires in a notification, which does include, by the way, a certification that you own the intellectual property and that as part of the court decisions on the DMCA that you've considered fair use and it doesn't apply. When a copyright owner formally notifies us that you don't have their permission to post their content on the site, we take down your upload to comply with copyright law. Keep in mind, videos can be removed from the site for reasons other than copyright, and also content ID claims don't result in a strike. And that's what I think we're talking about here, just based on the image that NYU put up, is a content ID claim, which is a claim of copyright infringement. That's how it works. That's what is being claimed, but it's not a strike. What happens when you get a copyright strike? Hey, we all make mistakes. Yeah, IP owners too. When you get a copyright strike, it acts as a warning. The first time you get a strike, you'll need to go through copyright school. Now, hey, I think this would be hilarious, right? I think if the NYU law 
program decided to pursue this and wound up getting a copyright strike, I think what they should do is they should make a video of their professors attending cartoon YouTube copyright school and talking about things like how the DMCA operates and how fair use operates and how wrong it is to steal copyrighted material with what appears to be a cartoon pirate. I think that is what should happen here if NYU law wound up going further and further with this, because I don't think there could be anything funnier. And I think it would make three, four million views if you just had a copyright law school have to attend YouTube's copyright school, right? That's good stuff. But that's a requirement if you get a copyright strike. It says, hey, you have to go to copyright school. The first time you get it, you go to copyright school. We do this so you can understand copyright and how it's enforced at YouTube. YouTube doesn't enforce copyright so much. It's a distributor. It's not a you know law enforcement agency, but it, it helps the copyright laws move on. We do this so you can understand copyright. I would love it. Copyright strikes may affect your ability to monetize. In addition, if your live stream is removed for copyright, if it was a live stream that got the strike, your access to live streaming will be restricted for 90 days, essentially because YouTube can't jump on it quick enough if you're live streaming and you're infringing. So you get essentially put in a penalty box. You're on probation. If you get three copyright strikes, your account, along with any associated channels, is subject to termination. Note the language there. We've talked about it before. YouTube doesn't mandate that they terminate your channel. It is subject to termination because YouTube might look at somebody that's very lucrative for them that infringes a couple times and say, we don't really want to terminate you. Here's a cease and desist letter. Here's some nasty thoughts from our CEO, but please stop doing that because we like your channel. All the videos uploaded to your account will be removed and you can't create new channels. There are three ways to resolve a copyright strike. Wait for it to expire. They, they expire every 90 days. But if it's your first strike, you will need to attend our cartoon school. Get a retraction. You can contact the person who claimed your video. Good luck contacting the Universal Music Group, by the way. And ask them to retract their claim of copyright infringement. Or you can submit a counter. If your video was mistakenly removed because it was misidentified as infringing or qualifies as potential fair use, you may wish to submit a counter notification. Strikes are bad. If you get three, you could lose whatever livelihood you have built up on YouTube. If you are something like an institution like NYU Law School, that is very untenable because all of these educational institutions have a mission to go out there with information. YouTube is the biggest video provider on the planet and you don't want to lose the right to operate a channel for your school. So these are very important questions and they're even more important for people that can't afford lawyers to consider whether whatever they did was fair use, whether they should pursue a litigation strategy. Because what happens with this content ID stuff is if you make life difficult for the content creator if you may, or content owner, if you make life difficult for YouTube, then yeah, they can escalate this into a removal and a copyright strike. And you get three of those and you're out. But it gets worse from there. It says, if the account is subject to multiple strikes, its ability to live stream could be restricted or the account could be terminated. While our colleagues in the communications department were highly supportive of our efforts, they were concerned that one misstep could wipe NYU Law's entire YouTube presence off the internet. That's correct. That is the kind of nuclear bomb that everybody that operates on YouTube is trying to consider. And it's not that I'm trying to position YouTube as evil here. Uh, it's that you can't know what you don't know. And what you've got is a black box of decision-making. You've got a lack of transparency and communication. You've got YouTube that has all of these kinds of policies and procedures that very clearly benefit the intellectual property purported owner that doesn't appear to be considering fair use as much as they should. Universal Music Group, of course, being the other side of Universal versus Lens, the ones that were told specifically that they had to consider fair use. But hey, when you look at all of this put together, everybody sitting back with a YouTube channel has way too much of a threat for any kind of footfall, any kind of minor mistake that they could do in pushing this forward. Because at the end of the day, if you can't win that court case, go through the whole process, pay all those lawyers, then you might get the copyright strike anyway, and you could potentially lose your channel because YouTube doesn't want to be involved in any of these fights. In deciding how we would continue to press our case, our question was unclear. Our single video was subject to multiple copyright infringement claims. If we failed to prevail, 
would that mean that the account was subject to one copyright strike because all of the claims were against a single video or multiple strikes tied to each claim against the single video? As there were four remaining claims against our video and three claims could result in the termination of the account, the distinction was highly relevant to us. I've had people ask in my social media, in my DMs, in comments to my videos, whether or not multiple strikes on a single video or multiple ID claims on a single video could result in multiple strikes. And the answer is, I don't think so. I think the language that YouTube uses suggests that one removal of a video is one strike, but it's not clear. And when you're dealing with stakes like this, that lack of clarity is a significant problem. And yeah, YouTube has every reason to protect its own interests here. But one thing that they should do, one thing that its users, its channel operators should be demanding from it is greater clarity on all these points. NYU Law then pulls up one of their pages that suggests that it's probably a single copyright strike, but admits that this isn't clear. What is an appeal? It's not the same as a dispute. If you've already disputed a content ID claim and feel it was mistakenly upheld by the claimant, you can appeal their decision. Proceed if you are confident. The claimant then has 30 days to respond. A claimant can either approve or reject your appeal or let it expire, resulting in the release of the claim. If they approve your appeal or fail to take action, the claim will be released, which lets you use the copyrighted material. But if they reject your appeal, the claimant can ask us to remove the video and you'll end up with a copyright strike, right? But we've got multiple claimants and multiple strikes so or multiple content ID claims. So you end up with a copyright strike upon removal. It's not 100% clear you, go, you can't wind up with four or certainly three, which is the kind of threshold question about whether or not you will lose the rights to your channel. And so this becomes an existential question. This is an escalation of the stakes for what amounts to one specific video and one specific instance where here, I think it's pretty clearly fair use, at least as described in this blog post. But even if it weren't, should that one video, should that one mistake result in the loss of your channel? I think justice, intuitive justice would suggest that it should not, but YouTube hasn't made that clear in the language that they use in their own documentation. This blog post continues, unfortunately, we still not do not know the answer to that question. This page, the one they highlighted, seems like the closest to having an answer, but it does not provide one to our specific question. We tried using the was this helpful link at the bottom to get additional information, but YouTube did not respond. No, they generally don't. The resolution. This would have been a dead end for most users. Unable to understand how the already opaque dispute resolution process might impact the status of their account, they would have had to decide if it was worth gambling their entire YouTube account on the chance that some combination of YouTube and the rights holder would recognize the legitimacy of their fair use claim, right? YouTube and Universal Music Group or whoever, WB Music, can just say, nah, Oh, and by the way, because you've now made us spend another hour thinking about this, we'd like that video removed. YouTube put a copyright strike on it. Please don't come at us again. And they can just do that. They're not supposed to. We talk a lot in virtual legality about how the law operates and how people operate within the law. They're not supposed to do that. And maybe, maybe even probably, you could win a lawsuit against them for acting this way. But that lawsuit would be massively expensive. And believe me, Universal Music Group has more lawyers than you do. And so you face this existential threat. We talked about a very similar issue to this yesterday in our video on Netflix, escalating their counterclaim against the Choose Your Own Adventure Company, Choose Co., when they decided to say, okay, fine, you want to sue us for using your name in our movie, then we are going to counterclaim that your trademark shouldn't exist because it's too generic. This is a common litigation strategy, and unfortunately, it's one of those aspects of the world in which we live that is the most unjust. You've got people with the big chip stack at the table that can say, fine, you want to keep pursuing this? We're going to make it very, very costly for you. Netflix says, fine. All right, you want to keep pursuing this? Then you risk, maybe a 1% chance, maybe more, you risk losing the entirety of your asset base in your company. Or in this particular instance, fine. You want to consider pursuing this? Then you risk losing your entire YouTube channel. And 
Maybe NYU doesn't care about that as much as Joe or Mary or Bob that's running a YouTube channel and trying to live off of that money. Although NYU still has very good interests in keeping their channel alive. Maybe they don't care about it quite as much as those folks, those individuals that are just trying to scratch out a living. But those individuals can't make this bet. They can't. Because YouTube and Universal and whoever can just say no. This blog post continues by kind of cementing that point. Since we are at the center of NYU law focused on technology and innovation, it was not a dead end for us. We reached out to YouTube through private channels to try to get clarity around the copyright strike rules. Uh, While we never got that clarity, some weeks later, we were informed that the claims against our video had been removed. That is how YouTube operates. They don't give you the information that you need to act on. Sometimes, if you go through the right back channels or if you rattle your saber in just the right way, you just find that they've backed down. Probably, YouTube went to Universal Music Group and said, "Uh, do you really want to pursue this against a law school? Uh, The video is about copyright infringement and fair use. You you sure you want to go down this road? And probably Universal said, ah, no, we don't. That's not worth it. That's not worth any any of this. We don't even want the publicity, although they're getting some now. So YouTube does that, goes through back channels, and then, oh, all of a sudden, NYU Law's claims against it are released. And here we are. But as they say, that's not available to most of us. We aren't NYU Law. We can't contact our buddies at YouTube and say, hey, bro, what is going on? And so we are left with that impossible choice as to pursue the rights that we very well have under the law or to not pursue them and to just let it go. And unfortunately, that happens all the time. The takeaway, what lessons can be learned from this process? First, it highlights how challenging it can be for users with strong counter arguments to dispute an allegation of infringement by large rights holders. That has been one of the ongoing themes in virtual legality, right? Large rights holders that assert things on kind of the bare minimum premise that maybe fair use doesn't apply in this instance. And they're going to be protected by the way the law operates, by the way YouTube operates, and because of this choice that is put before YouTube channel controllers, they are going to win the day almost every time because it doesn't make sense to go through the process of suing them, and especially not when you could potentially lose, and YouTube in the meantime can put a strike on your channel and make your life very, very difficult before you win the day five years hence. The Engelberg Center is home to some of the top technology and intellectual property scholars in the world, as well as people who have actually operated the notice and takedown processes for large online platforms. We had legal confidence in our position that would cost an average user tens of thousands of dollars, if not more, to obtain. That's right. Generally, even before you go through all this, you'd pay a lawyer to go look at the presidential materials, to look at your situation, to watch your video, and to put together a brief for you on exactly what the precedent looks like, how the law operates, and the strength or weakness of your position. That costs money to put together in the first instance. That this is a law school, they can look at it, they can talk to their colleagues and say, hey, can you look at this for us? Spend a couple hours and figure this out for us. And they had confidence in their position. Based on their description, I think they had every reason to have that confidence. Even all of those advantages were not enough to allow us to effectively resolve this dispute because YouTube's a black box and they don't speak to anyone. Instead, we had to also rely on our personal networks to trigger a process, one that is still unclear that resulted in the accusations being removed. This is not a reasonable expectation to place on average users. Second, it highlights the imperfect nature of automated content screening and the importance of process when automation goes wrong. A system that assumes any match to an existing work is infringement needs a robust process to deal with the situations where that is not the case. This is fantastically a thousand percent and completely true, right? We've talked about that. The algorithm isn't the problem in and of itself. It's actually a pretty smart idea, especially when you're dealing with however many millions of videos are uploaded a month on YouTube. But what you need is a backstop. You need to actually employ a robust number of actual human beings to look at these things and say, oh, that robot caught some false positives and we should kick some of this stuff. And that shouldn't be solely within the purview of the Universal Music Group or whoever the content holder is supposed to be. The human being at YouTube should be an intervening force that says, oh no, that's ridiculous. 
And it can inform Universal or whoever about that and then say, hey, if you want to make a formal claim, you have to do the certifications under the DMCA. You have to go through that process and actually assert that you've considered fair use. And if you still want to put that on the books, okay. And maybe YouTube has that communication with these various rights holders a little bit more transparently than we can see from afar. But if they aren't doing that, they need to be. And there needs to be more human beings in the process and not just the content holders' raw assertions. Our original counterclaim included a clear explanation of the nature of the video and the reasons for using the clips. It is hard to imagine someone with any familiarity with copyright law watching the video, reviewing our claim, and then summarily rejecting it. Nonetheless, that is what happened. No matter how much automation allows you to scale, the system will still require informed and fair human review at some point. Absolutely, 100%. Third, it highlights the costs of things going wrong. The YouTube copyright enforcement system is likely the most expensive and sophisticated copyright enforcement system ever created. If even this system has these types of flaws, it is likely that the system set up by smaller sites will be even less perfect. In truth, I'm not sure that this is what I would consider a flaw. The way fair use works under the law, the, the facts and circumstances tests, the I know it when I see it, and the various ways in which people can comment educationally or otherwise on another person's copyrighted material prevents an algorithm from being able to kind of judge those things. What the YouTube algorithm and other sites algorithms should be delivering is something along the lines of looks like infringement, but might be subject to fair use. And then a person should be evaluating it or the video creator should be evaluating it. And they should have to check a box that says, I am saying this is not infringement because I am claiming fair use. Things along those lines, having another person actually look at it before it's just automated and struck, right? That's where you get into trouble is that you can't identify fair use through a robot. At least I don't think so. These folks that are putting all this stuff together are smarter than me and maybe they'll come up with a magic solution. But considering fair use has lived under the law for a long time, we still can't say with any specificity how one thing will be treated by one judge over another thing and another judge. I don't think the robots can pick up on it so well. But even if they could, you do need that human being. You can't just say, oh, all your money's gone or, oh, here's a copyright strike because those content ID claims are the foothold that these various content owners use to threaten copyright strikes. And with the severity of that threat, you wind up in a system like this, where justice isn't served because people don't know where they might get in trouble. Because I can have all the videos in the world in virtual legality. You could have watched all of our stuff on MXR Plays or Jukin. You could have read the DMCA front to back, looked at everything that we have discussed in this channel. And if the robot picks up a content ID claim and you dispute it, and then the quote unquote content owner says, nah, the claim is right, then you're in the exact same position as NYU Law, except you don't have back channels to talk to YouTube and you don't have tens of thousands of dollars of lawyers to confirm for you that you're right. Instead, you're left in this kind of scared situation where you think you're right. You think for all the stuff that you've read and all the stuff that you watch that you are right, but you don't know and you've got these giant monolithic corporations coming at you and saying, okay, if you want to pursue this, we're going to bring out the big guns. And that's not really fair for anybody. The last thing I just wanted to touch on is how YouTube system works with the DMCA. I just want to touch on this because we've talked about it at length in virtual legality before. But basically, YouTube is reacting to the way the DMCA is written. I've pulled up the language here that says a service provider, that's YouTube, shall not be liable for all any of this kind of relief for infringement of copyrighted materials by reason of its storage on their platform if the service provider does not have knowledge in the absence of such knowledge is not aware of facts about infringement and upon obtaining such knowledge upon getting notification acts expeditiously to remove or disable access to the material that's the framework that YouTube is operating under they can't be sued they are not liable for the stuff people put up on their platform as long as they take it down when they are told there is a copyright infringement. And the content ID system is actually a middle road that YouTube developed that doesn't fully get to removal and copyright strikes and those kinds of things. It was designed to essentially help everybody involved in the digital era to get stuff up and to not worry about it so much by moving money to the content owner when content ID identifies these kinds of things. But when it doesn't, it forces the content ID owner 
to essentially ask for a strike, to ask for a removal. And then you get into this entire system of notifications and counter notifications. So that's really what's happening here. We've also seen people complain about the fact that YouTube doesn't always respond to a counter notification. Primarily that's because all the counter notification does is say, if YouTube puts it back up, they won't be liable for the initial removal. But YouTube, frankly, was almost never liable for the initial removal because as we've talked about in their terms of service, they can remove any video that they want for any reason. In fact, when we looked at the copyright strike description of what they put up there, they said, hey, there are plenty of reasons why a video might be removed that don't have anything to do with infringement because we're YouTube and we can do what we want with our platform. And yes, they can. That makes sense. And everybody needs to be aware of that. Uh, We did a video last week called YouTube is not your friend, but it's not the government either because they don't have First Amendment obligations, although you can still hold their feet to the fire about honoring kind of freedom of speech principles uh, if, if that's what you would like to do. But here... YouTube doesn't have liability for moving your video, and so they don't have to listen to your counter notification if they don't want to, which adds one more kind of thumb to the scales of how problematic it is when a big content owner, or at least a purported owner, can threaten you with a copyright strike, especially, you know, if you're sitting on two, and hey, maybe they're all unfair, but you can't risk losing your channel if you got tens of thousands of viewers or if your mission statement is to educate the populace. And as NYU says, that isn't fair. That's unjust. And I think one thing that we have to note is when that can happen to copyright lawyers, putting a video up to explain copyright infringement, it can happen to anybody. Because these robots don't care about why you were using blurred lines. They don't care about why you were referencing Beyonce. They find that, hey, that song exists in their database. It's infringement. That yellow light comes on. And if you want to dispute it, the quote unquote owner of that material can say, nah, it's good and can threaten your very livelihood or your mission. And that's not fair for anybody. The DMCA needs better penalties. YouTube needs a better, more robust, individualized system. These yellow lights should not be popping solely on what the robots find. And ultimately, that change is going to need to occur sooner rather than later, or more and more of these stories are going to pop up. YouTube has a lot of decisions to make. The legislature has a lot of decisions to make regarding the DMCA, the Communications Decency Act, and all sorts of questions that relate now to big tech that we are definitely going to be following in virtual legality. But for right now, it's clear that reform needs to happen because if this can happen to copyright lawyers at a prestigious law school, they can happen to you, me, or anybody else. This has been Virtual Legality for today. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, if you think somebody else might be interested in it, please share it around. Please post it on various forums or wherever you might find yourself, Reddit threads. I really enjoy having those conversations with you in the comments to these videos and elsewhere on my social media where you can follow me at Hogue Law or or anywhere else you might get in contact. Otherwise, if you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it in its podcast form, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.